Demon Slayer Season 4 Episode 2. <laughs> My clingy sense is tingling. Let me start out this pitch with a threat, but why do you feel uncomfortable? Yeah, I feel like there's a lot more to the, him than we've seen. Because we've, we've seen nothing. <laughs> we've seen absolutely nothing. And now he's dying. Her initial reaction was distrust. Why would that be her first thought? Oh, he's on his way. Never far. Oh, he died on in transit. Can't even get down the stairs correctly. Oh, is that what it is? I just thought it was like a very, very intelligent crow. But she's saying it's a demon. And we've seen that Genyu has dabbled in the demon arts himself. Maybe that's what's going on. Maybe there's a secret in the Hashira or in the Demon Slayer core that while they're trying to destroy demons, they're using demons or using demon power. That could be an issue. Bro, you are late for all your clinginess. I can't count on you. Yeah. One of the things that's remarkable about Demon Slayer, I mean, I can even imagine this being used as a criticism because of how extreme it is, though I happen to like it. There were just too many close calls where literally if one person hadn't done the most extreme thing, at the exact last moment, everything would be over, everybody would be dead, Tanjiro would be defeated with no successor. Obviously, this started a long time ago. It's a very old battle, but it's not just that line from the original Sun Breather to Tanjiro. It's like everyone on the periphery and everything like all the way into time, if you want to zoom out that far. Maybe most importantly, Rengoku, just because I say so. No more fleeing. Endless fleeing. This is actually an end in sight. Hope he's better at research than he is at stairs. But they're also putting themselves very directly in the line of fire. It's sort of all or nothing. Wait, who is Ubi? Maybe I'm misinterpreting who is Ubi Ashiki. I shouldn't be doing this, but he's the 97th leader of the Demon Slayer Corps in 97 seasons of leadership. Not once did they consider <laughs> <did her> training <laughs> until now. Better late than never. Episode two. What are Hashira Gyu? Tomioka's pain. Wow, are we starting with Gyu? <laughs> I got good news for you, I think. Since it's Demon Slayer, we'll probably learn to love you after you're dead. You will be loved after death. I mean, it's very cool that he's asking Tanjiro to do this. I mean, they do have that relationship. Huh, what is this, a guilt? Disappointment? Hopelessness? I mean, they, they go way back. This connection coming back around like that stick Tanjiro threw at Giyu in episode one. This is really sweet of him to be thinking about it this conscientiously. Hmm, that's a very interesting and honest answer. Probably not exactly what Tanjiro was hoping to hear. To her point, I think you do want to tread lightly with help. I think it only really works if it's totally divorced from personal expectation or need. I don't think this is the case for Tanjiro, but I think sometimes the helping of others is actually a mask for a request, which usually leads to disappointment. And even if that's not the motivation, you kind of just have to do your best towards that and then respect where people fall on that, how they react to it. How to approach people to make them feel like they're not alone. With those prerequisites out of the way, I think it might come down to some of the obvious stuff, like tell them that you're thinking about them and care about them. Spending a of time with them, I think, depending on the person, or that's something that would mean a lot to me. And going just from media, although this may be hard to find an equivalent for in real life, I think going to battle with someone is one of the best ways to make them feel less alone. Like whatever they're struggling with, if you can safely enter to a point where you're helping them, again, very crucially with no expectation of reward, like genuinely you want to do this thing for them. I think people will really feel that. And if they don't, it's probably just something about them and the way they are seeing themselves or something they want out of the I'm all alone, no one loves me type thing. And it might take a little time also, because they might be suspicious, you have to build a track record. Which is part of the reason why it has to be real and consistent. That's sweet. There's an the act of service right there, fighting alongside Tanjiro in his quest to touch Yu's soul. <laughs> God. Off to a great start. What Tanjiro has to advantage is his complete ignorance how annoying he is. He, in fact, did not. You're gonna accept my love, damn it. You're gonna like it. And if you don't, I'm probably not gonna pick up on the cues. <laughs> you are very close to me. You are very close. You are on my knee. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh man. Oh man. This. Oh man. This hurts. It's great. I'm a little bit jealous. Joking about the best thing Tanjiro has going for him is not realizing, not being self-conscious. To anybody who has this kind of radar, this is excruciating. But like not seeing that means you have no headwinds for plowing through that. I have someone very close to me who I grew up with who is just really sweet, really great person, has absolutely no social radar whatsoever. Cannot read the air as they say. And this person just like blasts through life. <laughs> I think it's very difficult for me as somebody who's like a little bit maybe very sensitive. I would say naturally a little bit socially anxious as like a base state. In fact, I've often wondered if that isn't a result of being in this exact situation with this person time and time again as a, as a kid and realizing that I saw things that this person didn't. But watching people's reactions to it, I think it's initially off-putting, but then once they figure out like, oh, this person just has a heart of gold and, and doesn't care and is just confident or whatever it is, they let down their guard and then actually really cool things can happen, really nice engagements can happen. And if they don't, it really doesn't matter because this person will never figure that out. Oh, giving a purpose is great too. Oh, he does have it in him, after all. Just a little bit. Wait, I'm confused. Did he quit? Right. Yeah, it feels like he's out. Okay. Blast through it, Tanjiro. Blast through it. Now I kind of understand why he picked Tanjiro. Tanjiro is... Maybe the right man for this. <laughs> sure. What, no barging in? No touching knees? Oh, you lost, Giyu. You ate the rice balls? I'm gonna touch your knees with my knees. It's gonna be great. <laughs> oh my god. Oh yeah, he will not give up. He'll, he's not will win. <laughs> oh, not in the bath. You just have to give in to this kind of obstinance. There's a gift to it. If you really are genuinely obstinate, you are the least flexible person. You will badger people <laughs> into doing what you want. Like the pain of not having it your way is so much less than the hassle of facing the prospect of dealing with this for the rest of your life, which is what would happen. I do happen to think that one of the best ways to get your way is to not be embarrassable, but there are trade-offs to this Nen condition. It has to be genuine in a key way. It has to come from deep. It's like Katamari, you know, if your energy is big enough, people will get rolled up by it. That's what I'm saying, yeah. He will. Or maybe he won't, but all that matters is that you thinks he will. Oh, you're okay. I don't care. That's why you're sad, boy? Come on, man. Whoa. Speaking of throwbacks. Crazy. Man, we're like starting back from the beginning in so many ways. I wonder if that'll continue. He was also water breather. Shut up. You couldn't stop. You couldn't let it go. I mean, speaking of legacy, th this is a path for Gyu. That's not a face you want to wake up to. That's not a face you want to wake up to. Okay, so it's self-imposed. It's guilt. Feeling of being a fraud. Oh, it's tough because, you know, you get the sense that that's sort of what makes him so strong. Is he is working extra to fill that sense of non-deservedness and guilt. Which, of course, I mean, I think it's probably obvious to the viewer and to Tanjiro that at this point, he is perfectly deserving to be here. It's like, who cares if you didn't take your SAT if you ended up graduating from Harvard? The tricky thing about it is that I can't say this is definitely the case for Gyu, but a lot of the time in this situation, that negative feeling, whatever it is, is subconsciously identified as the thing that got you here and made you successful and kept you safe. So it's sort of hard to part with. It's part of your whole process. And maybe this is obvious, but it also feels like this whole, I don't deserve to be here, I'm not a good Hashira, is really just a, a placeholder for the guilt he feels about what happened to Sabine. It's tricky because, I don't know, I feel like there's some, some attachment to this idea. Yeah, of course, yeah. Speaking of Rengoku, among others. Oh, I forgot about long-haired, long-haired Tanjiro, it's a good look. They paid the ultimate price. 
すごい剣士になっていただろうな。Right. You, like, master of survivor's guilt, right? You who thinks he's less talented, who idolizes Sabito. I'm the one? Why me? What a waste for the world. But you know who wouldn't feel that way? Sabito. Or Tanjiro. Or like anyone else who Gyu's helped or saved. It's just that he wouldn't be able to see that because it's all such bitter gruel in the, the face of the sense of loss that he's experienced and guilt. Yeah. Rengoku was so present in this season already. Such a heart ablaze. Maybe wait on that a bit. Defeat Muzan. Think you should say that. It was because of that experience. This is different. This is different. This is not the same. Right. You know, wouldn't have wanted this is Sabido. This is scary, man. It's scary if you really like because we don't have anything like de demons eating our sisters. I really hope. But if we could really see all the sacrifice that went into the lives we live, it would be impossible to unsee. I think the natural and easy response initially is the Gyu response, but it's not the final one. It wasn't even the first. It's the string. I landed. Yes, in the best way. What? <laughs> he lucked out hitting that, the solution the first time. Oh no, I made it out of his mouth. <laughs> that was a great question. Why? Oh, but they still did it. Spending quality time. It's a tactic, Tanjiro. Stay focused on your soba eating contest. Why? Because of the research? Been hanging around with, hanging around with Tanjiro. Huh, why is she leaving it to her? Man, this, this Hunter training is stirring things up. I was ready to go with like badass hardcore training. Turns out we're not training our bodies, we're training our, our hearts and our souls. The real battles are the demons inside of us. A lot of people seem to know a lot of things they're not really telling us. I think the cohesiveness of this unit could go beyond just the training and the common cause, but, but like actually being close, which Tanjiro is a great catalyst for. Oh yeah, ending. Already this feels like it could have been an opening. This is really cool. Yeah, I want to see more of this as well. That Rengoku Hill ever present. So it is Muzan, right? But then the crow was with him. Never mind, I don't want to try to read story elements out of the ending. Oh, he's literally wearing it? Both of them? I don't know if that's healthy. We've become friends, but only in the Taishanar secret. In the epilogue. That's actually the title of the episode? Wow, very literal. Yeah, as I alluded to, this is kind of a surprise. Not what I expected, but I really liked it. Tanjiro was the best person for that job, given that he could empathize exactly with the situation and also has the solution, which zoomed out is one of my favorite things, which is like, what are you going to do with the pain that you have and the challenges that are in front of you? Like, is it just is that just it? Is it game over? I mean, not only is that just unsatisfying to watch, to experience, really looking at it as they got at it this episode, is it not an affront to everything? Everything that came before you. Of course, that kind of thinking, if the person's not ready, will likely plunge them further into their despair because now what they're doing that they don't believe they can get out of has been made worse through perspective. Like I already hated myself without thinking about the burden of living up to the legacy of the past and all the gifts that I've been given. Nevertheless, it's always a choice. It's a lot harder to do in real life because one's problems seem dire and threatening, no matter how objectively big or small they are, if that's how they feel. But I think the fact that it's so clear when you see it is telling. Like which narrative would you rather have in any given moment? Like you were crushed by your own misery, which essentially, no matter how real the, the issues actually are, you've like added another one, which is yourself. From experience, I don't even think losing to the world is all that spiritually painful. I think what's really painful is feeling like you've you've failed yourself. There is a real difficulty here though that I see in Gyu, which is that those sort of ruminations are not helpful or they're detrimental, but they, they are there for a reason. They do serve a purpose. Gyu's path I think is actually great, but he's at a point where there needs to be a transition where the, the mind catches up with the person. That pain was used towards becoming this great person or great father. Writer, someone who lives in service to others partly because of the image but now that he's there the image needs to catch up you know like it's not his fault what happened he is capable he is honoring the legacy of his sister and of Sabido he will continue to do so he can let go a little bit of like this identity that's been the source of both a lot of strength but also a lot of pain <laughs> <laughs>